Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. Welcome back to Bob the Science Guy. Today we're moving on to the next challenge question from Professor Dave. Now, Professor Dave's next challenge is for the Flat Earth to make a prediction based on their model. Now, granted, they haven't been able to come up with a model, but they should be able to at least make a prediction. Where will we look to find the planet Venus four years in the future? When is the next total eclipse of the sun visible in Europe going to occur? And what is the path of the shadow of the sun? Science can easily do that. Can the flat earth? Let's find out. You know, a good example of this would be the Eddington experiment with a solar eclipse of May 1919. Under general relativity, Einstein had predicted that large masses like the sun would warp space-time, and as a result, light would be bent by gravitational lensing. So what Eddington did was he mapped the stars in the area where the solar eclipse would occur. And at the time of the eclipse, he went down and took a photograph of it. And here it is. This is one of Eddington's actual photographs. And as you see, he's got the stars mapped out. Now, Einstein's theory of general relativity predicted that something as massive as the sun would warp space-time and cause a bending of light called gravitational lensing. So as you see, here is an actual location of a star, and here is the light coming from the star. It's bent by the sun and comes to Earth in this line. Now, an observer on Earth would see the star up at this location. This is very similar to the geometric versus the apparent horizon, which is why we get looming. But this is basically a illusion or a mirage out here where we see this star. Einstein predicted very precisely where that apparent location of the star would be if it was photographed past the eclipse of a sun. And here is one of the actual photographs that was taken of the eclipse in May of 1919. Prior to the eclipse, they mapped the location of these stars. And when the eclipse came and the sun was in this position, they identified those stars on some photographs and measured to see whether or not their position had changed. And as it turns out, the position was changed by exactly the amount that Einstein had predicted, confirming Einstein's theory of general relativity. This is what science does. It makes predictions and then tests those predictions against reality. And in this case, reality matched the prediction, which indicated that our understanding of the process involved was correct. Number three, here's an idea. What if you were to actually make a prediction with your model? Like any prediction. You know, those things that you have to do in science for it to be science? Pick any celestial object, a planet, a comet, a star. Now pick any time in the future, and using only the Flat Earth model and nothing else, tell me where it will be at that time. Well, sure. The astrolabe. Now, before you go any further, the astrolabe was invented about a thousand years ago, and it was designed to work on an Earth that they knew was spherical. The challenge is for you to use your flat Earth model to make this prediction, not rely on something from the globe like an astrolabe or a sextant. But carry on. The astrolabe kind of looks like a flat Earth. It's a flat disk. You know, like an astrolabe, a nautical sextant is designed to be held upright. Now, the fact that an astrolabe is a disk, and if you hold it like that, it would kind of look like their flat Earth map, doesn't mean that's the way that it's used. It's held perpendicular to the surface of the Earth, and it measures angles between the horizon and celestial objects in 360 degrees. So... The very fact that it's a disk doesn't have anything to do with suggesting somehow that the Earth itself is a disk. It's just the way the instrument's shaped. It is an analog computer, one of the best. It has between 500 and 1,000 functions, maybe more, things that it can do. It's very accurate. 
It's been around for a thou thousand years, I think, maybe more, thousands of years, but in the most uh, commonly found form, it's, I'd say, about 600 years old, so it predates the globe. Well, no, the Greeks knew the Earth was a globe 2,500 years ago. The Chinese may have known it as much as 4,000 years ago. So I don't know where you're coming up with this idea that something only 600 years old somehow predates something that's at least 2,500 years old. But that must be flat earth logic for you. The aired opful, you know that thing? That's your model, the first one. And when it was made in 1492, it was incorrect. Okay, just a quick correction. This is the oldest surviving globe. It is not the first time mankind realized the Earth was spherical. You know, think of Eratosthenes, who measured the circumference of the Earth with the shadow at Alexandria. That was working on knowledge that was already established on the shape of the Earth. So even at that time, which was well before the Common Age, the Earth had been known to be spherical for hundreds of years, uh, all the way back to the time of Plato. So to suggest that when they manufactured this particular globe in 1492, somehow that was a new thing, it wasn't. The shape of the Earth had already been known for thousands of years prior to this particular globe being made. It's simply the oldest one that we still have in inventory. It shows the continent of, uh, well, Europe and part of Africa and, and Asia out of proportion. It's not to scale. Now, the reason I say that is we're told that Eratosthenes found and calculated with great accuracy the circumference of the Earth. Well, it was the path of the sun around the equator found to be approximately 40,000 kilometers. He was very, very close. Eratosthenes determined the circumference of the Earth on a great circle that went from Alexandria to Cyrene, which is modern-day Aswan. It went north-south. The equator goes east-west. It has nothing to do with the equator. It has nothing to do with the path of the sun. What it had to do with was the fact that at the summer solstice, the sun was directly over Cyrene, and when he put a vertical stick 500 miles north in the ground, it cast a seven-degree shadow. And since there was 500 miles between the two points, and seven degrees is approximately one-fiftieth of a circle, he was able to calculate the circumference of the Earth on a point that passed between those two cities. It had nothing to do with the equator, and it had nothing to do with the movement of the sun. It was the position of the sun at noon on the solstice. If you're going to quote science, quote science correctly, which involves reading more than just the headline of the experiment. You have to actually understand what the experiment involved. And that path, I agree, is pretty close to that based on what we know. And that would denote a certain scale and distance proportion of the land masses that were verifiable in 1492. Okay, once again, you don't understand what Eratosthenes did. Eratosthenes basically determined the size of the spherical Earth. It had absolutely nothing to do with the size, location, or relative proportions of the land masses on that Earth. It was simply a blank ball of X kilometers in circumference. Portion of the land masses that were verifiable in 1492. I don't think that the Erdapfel approximates them very close at all. I think it's very poor. And I think as a predictor, as a navigational tool, it would have been pretty much worthless compared to an astrolabe, very much worthless. So let's take a moment and talk about an astrolabe. 
An astrolabe does one thing and one thing only. It measures the angle from the horizon to an object in the sky. The fact that it's useful for navigation is to tell you how far away you are from the equator. And an astrolabe is only accurate to about a quarter of a degree, so an astrolabe would get you probably to within 15 miles of your target, whereas a sextant will get you to within one to two nautical miles of your destination. But in order for either of them to work, you have to have an accurate map and a way of determining your longitude. An astrolabe, a sextant, very accurate and very much spherical Earth-based navigation devices. Now, once again, your challenge is to use your flat Earth model to predict an eclipse of the sun or a position of a planet. You cannot use spherical Earth instruments to determine the location of a planet or an eclipse on a flat Earth. You have to use the flat Earth model. So. I guess the first thing that you have to do is come up with some sort of a flat earth model, which you so far have not been able to do. Well, guys, in this episode, we challenge the flat earth to make a prediction, any prediction, using their model. Obviously, they failed at that because they frankly don't have a model. So what they did instead was try to take ownership of navigation aids used on a spherical earth and claim that somehow they would be able to do the same thing on a flat earth. We've already demonstrated in other videos that sextons and astrolabs do not give accurate sightings to things like the North Star on a flat plane. They require a curved surface and parallel rays coming from the celestial object in order to work properly and read out latitude correctly. Because the author of this video doesn't understand the use of either an astrolab, he seemed to think that it was used on its side, or a sextant, and didn't bother researching either instrument. He wouldn't know that. So, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. Make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there, and I look forward to seeing you in the next installment of Professor Dave Explains 10 Challenge Questions for the Flat Earth. Take care and be safe.